you talk to me for a little while? Or at least until the baby cries, or we both fall So many miles, darling, won't you talk to me for a little while? Or at least until the baby cries, or we both fall asleep. Church, will you stand with me? Let's worship Jesus this morning.
Good morning, Ridge Church. So happy to be here with you this morning to worship God. Um, I just want to share with you Psalm 34. It tells us that it says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will speak of his praises constantly. Come, let us worship him together. Let's exalt his name together. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So let's taste and see that the Lord is good this morning. Let's enter his presence and let's worship him this morning. Amen.
God, that is our prayer. God, this morning that your presence, God, that we, that we feel it. God, that not only that we feel it, God, but God, we are moved by your presence. God, that we are moved by your spirit this morning. God, that you speak deeply to our hearts. God, that you reveal to us, uh, God, uh, places that, God, that we have kept from you. God, that you, you move us closer towards you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, you can have a seat. My name is Bobby, and I'm one of the pastors here at the Ridge Church, and we're so glad that you're with us uh, here this morning, and uh, welcome to, to the Ridge. If you are here for the first time today, we're so glad that you are here. A couple of things I want to let you know about, but there is a, a Connect card in your seat close to you there somewhere. It's a little white card. You might see it there. Uh, we would love for you to take a few moments and, and begin to fill that out during today's service at some point. Uh, maybe I get boring to you at, at one point in time, and you can just go ahead and start writing on that. But uh, you can go ahead and start to fill that out. And then before you leave today, you don't have to do anything with it right now, but before you leave, there's a place right outside these doors here. It's called Ridge Central. There's a table there. We'll have some great volunteers out there to talk with you. Uh, I'll be out there hanging out as well. But stop by that table. Drop that card off. We've got a free gift we'd love to give you today just for being here. And so for all of us in the room, though, that Connect card is a great way for you to let us know how we can be praying with you, uh, maybe what God lead you for uh, into a next step with today, uh, maybe something uh, during today's worship or message, whatever it is, uh, God hopefully is leading you to a place to take a next step, and we would love to help you take that next step. So you can use that card to let us know what that is, let us know how we can be praying with you um, as well. If you uh, don't have a card near you or don't have a pen, you can just use our online connect card, which is uh, ridgechurch.info. You can do that on your smartphone and uh, you can take care of that there. So we're going to continue in our worship through our giving. And if you are here for the first time, we don't want you to feel obligated at all to give. You're welcome to, but we don't want you to feel obligated at all to give. This is an opportunity for us to, to be generous because of God's generosity to us and for us. And so there'll be some baskets come by your rows in just a moment. Or you can give online at ridgegive.com. So be sure to do that. I want to let you know, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting choked up here. I <laughs> can't talk. I uh, want to let you know about uh, a couple of things that are coming up. In fact, uh, we've got so many announcements and so many things that are happening here at Ridge Church. The best way for you to find out what those things are is through the Uversion Bible app. It's an app that we use on our phones, and so you can download it for free in the App Store. It's just If you just search Bible, it's a brown Bible. It says Holy Bible. It's called the Uversion Bible app. But if you download that and then click on More and then Events... Ridge Church will pop up. You'll be able to see everything from today's message, all the notes, all the scripture, as well as all kinds of announcements. And so there are a ton of announcements, things like Ridge Kids uh, Volunteer Pool Party. There's a Ridge Summer Nights Pool Party coming up on the 24th here at Oak Ridge Pool. There are uh, women's small groups that are starting up in August, all kinds of things that are happening. And so we want to make sure that you find out about those things and uh, so be sure to do that. And if you are not on our email list, fill out a Connect card, put your email on there, and you'll be get, getting all those announcements in your email as well. So with that said, we're going to take up our offering here in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to show you a video. Because one of the things that we do here at Ridge Church every single month is we do something called the Dollar Club. Now, the Dollar Club here at Ridge Church, as we say this, we say, give a dollar, make an impact. And so we ask everybody in our church through all of our services, we say, hey, on the first Sunday of the month, we're asking you to give just one dollar. Some people give more, some people give a dollar, and that's okay. But we take all of that money, and we don't keep any of it for ourselves. In fact, we actually put a little extra with it. And then we make an immediate impact through an organization, a nonprofit, a ministry partner, or sometimes it's a person. But we make an immediate impact with them and to them through Dollar Club. And so this past month, you guys did an amazing thing with ADFAC. That's uh, Aid to Distressed Families of Appalachian Communities right here uh, in our community. You guys did an amazing thing with them. And I want you to see what your dollar did and the impact that you had with ADFAC. So take a look at this. We are here at the ADFAC School Supply Depot, and this is Teresa and Becky and Annie, and they are going to tell us about the School Supply Program and ADFAC for Anderson County. Great, so I'll start and I'll talk about what ADFAC is. ADFAC is Aid to Distressed Families of Appalachian Counties. We serve um, Anderson, Morgan, Campbell, and Roan counties, um, doing a variety of programs to help self-sufficiency for lower income families. So everything from something as simple as paying a utility bill um, when someone's in a crisis situation 
to something more permanent like a home repair or even a new home build. Um, but everything we do comes with a piece of counseling that helps them to kind of, how did you get to this crossroads in your life? What kind of help do you need and what do we need to do and help you to go forward um, to help you find your path towards self-sufficiency. So we do everything we do with a, a tone of compassion and a tone of understanding and um, that's just kind of the, the really quick story of what is ADVAC. Right. Uh, Becky can tell you a lot more about the school supply program which we also firmly believe helps to get our children in the area on their first step towards self-sufficiency. So the way it works is all year long, Teresa and I shop for um, materials, and as you can see, our room is pretty fully stocked mm -hmm. right now. And then in the month of, um, well, April and May and June, we get all the supply lists from every single school, and we put them on spreadsheets, and we get the list from each school, and then we get the number of students from each school as well. So they tell us how many boys, how many girls, and as you can see, we're packing, uh, putting tags on today for Sunbright, but we have about 260 volunteers that come in to help us pack, so we could not possibly do this by ourselves. Um, so every day, the month of July, starting July 8th through August 1st, we will be in here packing for schools. Uh, we have volunteers that not only pack, but they take it directly to the schools. We rely on the school counselors to determine which students uh, will benefit the most from the backpacks. So. Um, they are very responsible about determining who qualifies and who doesn't. How much does all this cost? Cost? Oh, yes. well, that's a good question. I, I work really hard to find the best price for each item. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know I've spent about $50,000 so far this year, probably wow. a little bit more. But for 4,000 kids, that's not too bad. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And so we do rely on, we, we get grants, and we try to write lots of grants, and we rely a lot on the generosity of others, so we're very um, grateful that you're here today. All right, so every month we at the Ridge take a, a collection that we call Dollar Club. We say give a dollar, make an impact. And so where we are wanting to put our Dollar Club this month is with ADFAC, and we would like for you to specifically use it for the school supply program. Got it. So however you can best use okay our Dollar Club money this way. We are thrilled to be a part of partnering with ADFAC. And we are also looking forward to next month coming and helping you stuff backpacks. Yay. So if anyone wants to participate in that, um, just email me and let me know, or you can let me know at church. Because we want to, guys, this, can you see all this? This is amazing in here. So um, any way that we can participate with you guys in the future, we would really love to step up on a volunteer basis and with Dollar Club as well. So um, we are happy, happy, happy to have you in the roster of Dollar Club. Well, we are on. happy, happy, happy to be there. So thank you so much. It's very right. kind of all of you to, um, to support an agency like ADFAC. It really, it really does make a huge difference. So it does make you. a difference and seeing it, is believing. It so can and I'm be, hoping yes. that you'll be available when the kids receive their backpacks if you're going to be doing something at Willowbrook. It'll be nice for you'll get you'll get to see the receiving and maybe even more than we will. So that's absolutely awesome. that's great. absolutely and it's I think that um, we're also needing volunteers for delivery of the backpacks. Um, you <laughs> can check with April <laughs> Allen on that. Okay, good. So you use this thousand dollars from our oh, dollar gosh. club. Oh my gosh! <laughs> in a way that we know only you can. Yeah. Oh, so that's amazing. fabulous. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. That is thank you. That's amazing. Thank you. Really, really appreciate it. <laughs> nice job. Nice job, everybody. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah. Good. So as you can see, you gave $1,000 to Dollar Club this past month, and that $1,000 went directly to ADFAC, and that $1,000 is going to put school supplies into backpacks that are going to counties all around us, even some right here in Oak Ridge, uh, to impact students. One of our core values here at Ridge Church is to impact communities, and so we do that in a lot of different ways, and you had a part in doing that this past month through Dollar Club, so thank you. Let me pray, and let's give together. Father, we thank you for your generosity to us and for us. God, we pray this morning that as we, uh, as we give, God, that, that we give out of your generosity to us. God, that we give sacrificially. God, that we give generously. And that we give with a joyous, happy heart. It's in your name we pray. 
Amen. Take courage when the road is long. Don't ever forget you are never alone. I want you to live forever underneath the sky so blue. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Calvin. So we are wrapping up our series in the Gospel of John this morning. We have uh, together been in the Gospel of John for a little over a year. We started in March of 2018, and here we are, no, 2009, yeah, two, is that right? What, what year is this? I don't even know. Um, 2018, and uh, we are getting to the very end of today. And so if you happen to miss any of these messages and you want to go back and listen to them, uh, you can do that on Apple Podcasts by searching for Ridge Community Church or just go to our website, uh, ridgechurch.cc, and you can uh, catch up on all of those today. But uh, we are ending in chapter 20, and the reason why we are ending in chapter 20 is because uh, chapter 20 sort of summarizes and um, sends us out into the mission Jesus that that the gospel of John was written for in the first place and so if we go all the way back when we began this series in, in March of last year we actually did a message on uh, chap or verse 31 of chapter 20 where John gives the whole reason of, of why he wrote the book of John and, and wrote these things down in the first place and so he said this in verse 31 he says I have written these things so that you may believe that Jesus Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, listen, he says, that by believing, you may have life in his name. And so the whole reason John wrote all of these things down is so that you and you and you and you and me, so that all of us in the room, so that we would believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And so that we would believe that Jesus is going to do all the things that he promised he would do, and that if we would believe these things, if we would believe that Jesus is who he says he is, then that we would be sent ourselves to proclaim that same message. And so we're ending the Gospel of John together this morning in chapter 20 for this very reason. Because ending here, I think, is, is the perfect way to end this book so that you would believe. And, and that is our goal. That is our goal as a church. We, we want to help you. We want to help you because we help each other. That's what we do together as a church. We want to, as a church, we want to help each other follow Jesus so that we become fully engaged disciples of Jesus. That's why we exist together as a church. That's why we 
gather together. It's what we do together so that we will follow Jesus. And here's what I know to be true is that if you follow Jesus the way that Jesus actually leads us and says, here's the way that I want you to follow me. Here's the way that, that if you follow me this way, if you believe what I'm asking you to believe, then it will transform us in a way not only changes our lives, but changes the lives of people around us in an amazing way, in an amazing way. And so here, the context of, of what we're looking at today, uh, we actually talked about this last week from chapter 19 and chapter 20, but Jesus has been crucified. He was arrested, beaten, crucified on a cross on a Friday. And as we looked at last week, we looked at the resurrection of Jesus resurrection of Jesus and what we talked about last week is we said that if it is true and cards on the table I 100% believe that it is true that if it is true that Jesus Christ rose from the dead rose from the grave and that he is alive and is now seated at the right hand of God interceding for us if that is true and again I believe that that is true then there are implications of the resurrection for every one of us in the room that say that we believe that and even if you don't say that you believe that, there's an implication of that as well. And so we talked about those implications last week. And so the context of what we're looking at, what Calvin just read here in verses 19 through 23, the context of that is, is it is the evening of the resurrection. That morning, John and Peter and Mary and some of the other women, they had went to the tomb and saw an empty tomb. Jesus appeared to, to Mary and and, and, and to, to others, and, and now Jesus is appearing to the rest of the disciples in a locked room, in an upper room, because they're all up there trying, sitting around trying to figure out, is he alive? Did he really rise from the dead? And that's the context of, of today's passage, and so it picks up later in, in the evening, the Sunday of the resurrection. And so I wanted to spend our last day in John here, because I am convinced, I am 100 percent no doubt in my heart no doubt in my mind i am convinced church that if we would embrace the commission of jesus together that we would see the world transform right in front of us now i'm going to ask for a little crowd participation here it's okay uh, to participate a little bit so i'm going to ask for your participation here. but by just raise of hands ask you this question. How many of you would say that you want to see the world transformed because the world needs Jesus? How, how many of you would say that you believe that? You believe that? Keep your hands up for just a minute. I want you to look around. Now, you're all accountable to each other, okay? Because you just admitted that to one another, all right? Like, we're all accountable to each other. So if we are saying that, and I believe that most of us in the room are saying that, like, like we are saying that, if you didn't raise your hand, I'm praying for you, but if you are... If you are saying that, then what you are saying is you are saying that, yes, I believe that the transforming power of Jesus is real because I've seen it happen in my life, and I want to see that for others. If you believe that to be true, and I believe that to be true, then what Jesus is going to tell his disciples, not only was it for them, but it's also for us. And it has massive, massive implications on our lives. So that's what we're looking at this morning. And so uh, just to, to do a, a little uh, contextual work here for us really quickly, um, I'm going to read again what Calvin just read. But I want to unpack a little bit of it as we go. So in verse 19, it says this. It says, on the evening, again, so this is the evening of the day of resurrection. So that's Sunday evening. It says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples, they were glad when they saw the Lord. So understand what Jesus just did here. Number one, he just walked through a door that was locked. That's amazing in and of itself, right? Like, that's a pretty cool party trick. I don't know what you do at parties and the tricks that you do. That's a pretty cool party trick. Jesus walks through a locked door and was like, peace. He had to say peace because it probably scared, you know, that out of them, right? Like, like just like scared them because he just shows up in this locked room where they're hiding out. And he says to them, he says, peace, but he doesn't just say 
once, he actually says it a second time, verse 21, he says, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And so why does Jesus say peace to them two times? Well, I don't want you to miss this because this is really, really important as we go forward in today's message. The peace of Christ, listen, the peace of Christ will always precede the mission of Christ. The peace of Christ will always precede the mission of Christ. We operate out of this peace that he gives. And so what that means is that as we go, the results, listen, the results are up to him. Jesus calls us to mission. Notice what Jesus said. He says, as I have been sent, I am also sending you. But we operate out of his peace. That means that that he gives us a mission. He gives us a commission to, to live out to the best of our broken and flawed ability because we're not always going to get it right. We're not always going to do it perfect. In fact, we'll rarely do it perfectly. But he says, I'm sending you, but you're going to operate out of my peace. That means that the results are up to me. Your job and my job is just to be obedient. And we leave the results up to him. Because peace was accomplished on the cross. That's why he shows them his hands and his side, the scars. And as he tells them this, he tells them that the Holy Spirit will be given to empower them. And he says, I want you now to go and to carry my love, my grace, and light to the nations to extend my peace to the world. And if that is the mission, that is, when I say embrace the commission of Jesus, Jesus is commissioning his disciples to not stay hidden in the upper room, but to come down and to be amongst the people and to go. And as we'll look at here in just a few moments in Matthew chapter 28, he says, I don't want you to just go here and here and down the street, but I want you to go to the nations to make disciples. And he says, and I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you the Spirit. My Spirit will be with you. So how then, how then, Do we do this? How then do we engage in the mission of Jesus? Well, a couple of things. If you're taking notes, you can write these down or they'll be on the screen. They're in your YouVersion app as well. But number one is this. Number one is we serve a God who is on mission himself. We serve a God who is on mission himself. We are not the only ones on mission, but God himself is on mission because God came to us as a rescue mission. God came to us as a rescue mission. He he took action and sent Jesus as he looked at the broken, fractured world through our sinfulness. There had to be a rescue. And in order to rescue us, he had to send his only son, Jesus, right? It's what Jesus himself said. He said, for God so loved the world that he sent who? Sent himself, sent Jesus, his son, Because God is on mission himself. You see, you and I together, you and I, if you are a follower of Christ, you are a believer, you are a Christian, then you and we are made in God's image and therefore being made in God's image, we are called to God's mission. And if God is on mission, then you and I are called to be on mission ourselves. When I was a kid, I, you know, growing up in church, specifically as a teenager, I remember I didn't always grow up in church. I really started going to church. I became a follower when I was about 13 years old. But uh, I grew up in this uh, this little, small, tiny country church uh, in Clinton, and and I thank God for that church. I thank God for the people that that showed me who Jesus was. Uh, but I remember specifically on Wednesday nights in that church, I would go to this thing called RAs. Anybody know what RAs and GAs is? Anybody know what that is? All right, a couple of you in the room. That's all right. So RAs and GAs. It, it, so if you don't know what that is, I'll just tell you what it is. It's like Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts for Christians, okay? That's, that's really what it was. Except the girls, they didn't sell cookies. They sold, like, bracelets. I don't know what it was. But anyway, like, I wasn't on the girl side. I was on the boy side. So RAs and GAs. RAs stands for Royal Ambassadors, and so here's what we did most of the time if we weren't playing basketball. 
on football after and before when that service is we would get together and somebody would come in and they would show us and teach us about missionaries all across the world. Sometimes they were right here in, in the United States and other times they were in other parts of, of the world. And we would read about these missionaries and we would learn about how they would literally uproot their entire families and entire lives and they would go to countries where literally they, they could be put to death for talking the gospel of Jesus. And I remember reading about some of these missionaries, and I remember reading about the dangers and some of the things that they faced as they would speak and talk about the gospel in these foreign countries, and, and knowing that their lives would be put on the line by doing so. I remember thinking to myself, why would they do that? Like, why would they give their lives to that? Like, why would they risk their lives for that? Why would, they, why would they give their lives to that? And then as I got a little bit older and as I learned a little bit more and as God began to open my own heart and my own eyes to what was happening, I finally started to understand exactly why they would do that. It's because it's what Jesus did. It's because it's what Jesus did. God sent Jesus on that same mission. To give up his life. To rescue you and me. And so that as being rescued ones, that we would be sent to take that same message, that same gospel across the street, into our workplaces, and even across the world. Wherever he would send us. Because it's what God had done for us. It's what God is doing for us because God is on mission himself. And so Jesus said, he said, as I was sent, so I send you. And so how was Jesus sent then? I, I think this is really important as we sort of understand the, the context of this. How was Jesus sent? Well, first of all, he came to us. Jesus came to us and, and he went to where you and I were. He met, like, think about this for just a moment. Think about the way that God saved you, the way that he you the way that he saved you the way that he revealed himself to you like he came and met you where you were didn't he he did i'll answer the question for you he did he met you where you were he meets us where we are because he comes to us and I think for us, for, for you and I as followers of Christ, knowing that God is on mission himself and that God sends us to be on mission, too many of us Christians are standing safely on the shore and we're just shouting advice at people who need us to be in the water swimming with them. Church, listen to me. It is so easy for us to get on Facebook and tell people, hey, here's how you should live. Here's what you should. Here's how you should be. When what Jesus has done for us is Jesus jumped into the water as we were drowning to save us. And it cost him his life. Jesus gave his life for this mission. He said, he said I have come. I have come to seek and to save the lost. And he did it by giving it his own life. And so let me ask you this question. I want you to think about this. This is not something that you have to answer out loud, but I want you to think about it. What are you giving your life for? Like, seriously, I want you to deeply think on this for just a moment. What are you giving your life for? If you're watching online this morning, what are you giving your life for? What are you and you and you and you and me, what are we giving our lives for? And when I say giving our lives for, here's what I want you to think about. At the end of your life, all is said and done, and there's people standing around drinking sweet tea and eating some, you know, whatever, some casserole, some chicken, some whatever people eat, you know, when we're gone, like the stuff that we want to eat, you know what I mean? But they're all sitting around and talking about you and talking about me and telling the stories about you and your life. What do you want them to say? You know what? They gave their lives to make sure that people knew who Jesus was. Or are they going to say, 
what, man, he, he climbed that ladder. He got to the top. He was good at his job. You know, she, she gave her life to, you know, to, to the PTO and taking them kids around all over the place. And look, look I'll, listen, none of those things are bad things, but any time that we make good things, God things, they become bad things. What are you giving your life for? I, when that day comes for me, and it will, but when that day comes for me, from the time that I was 13 years old, my hope has always been that what will be said about me was that he loved Jesus and he loved the local church and he believed that it was the hope of the world because Jesus gave his life for it. What are you giving your life for? So not only is God on mission, but Jesus, Jesus, we are sent by Jesus. Number two, we are sent by Jesus. I want you to understand that, that God, God did not save you to put you up on some shelf and knock the dust off of you every now and then. Do you know that? Like the, the, the goal of being a follower of Christ is not to see if you can make it safely and unscathed into heaven. That's not the goal of following Jesus. The goal of following Jesus is to be crucified with Christ. So that it is no longer you who live, but it is Christ who lives in you and through you. For the sake of the gospel. It, one of the things that I love about I have my son, he's 11, and I've had the opportunity to uh, to to coach some of his basketball teams and, and to coach him through some different things. And, and as a coach, and maybe you've gotten to be a coach at some point in time, maybe you're a coach now, but um, one of the things, like, if you've ever coached kids, like, understand this, uh, if you've ever coached any team whatsoever, if you've ever played on a team, you understand this. You, I've never in my entire life of coaching, I've never had a kid come up to me and say, hey, coach, I just wanted to tell you I am super excited to be on this team, and I cannot wait to sit on the bench. Like, that's, I, that's my hope, that's my goal, that's my passion. Like, I love it. Like, it's just my thing. Like, I've never, I've never in my life, and if you've ever coached a team, you have never in your life probably had a kid. You've probably had some kids that go out there that were like, you probably need to sit on the bench a little bit longer. But, like, even as a parent, like, as a parent, like, you've signed your kids up for things, and they've played on soccer teams and baseball teams and other things, and you start to get agitated when they're sitting on the bench not getting in the game, you're like, I'm going to go have a word with that coach, right? Like you went, you, you went and you talked to him, you're like, hey, my kid needs to be playing. Why? Because everybody wants to play. Everybody wants to play. But when it comes to being a follower of Christ, you know what? A lot of us, we are good at praying. We are good at paying. And by paying, I mean like funding the mission. Those things are good. We should do those. We should pray. We should fund the mission. Absolutely called to those things. But sometimes we are very, very bad at playing. Like it doesn't make any sense for us as, as followers of Christ to go, hey, you know what? God, I'm, I'm good right over here on the bench. Like, I, I just, like, put me right over here. Like, I'll sit. I just kind of watch everybody else do it. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Jesus, he says, I have been sent, and so I am sending you. And so you, here, look at me, church. You, if you are a follower of Christ, you are a Christian. You have been sent also. In fact, Jesus makes it super clear in Matthew 28, verse 16. He says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Jesus said, I'm going to be ascending into heaven. We're going to have one more little party. We're going to have more, one more little gathering. I've got something really important I want to say to you. And so he directs them to this place. And it says, and when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. I've never understood that verse. <laughs> There are some people, some disciples who see a man who had been crucified, dead, and now is alive, and they looked at him and they go, eh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Like it says they doubted. I never got that. But 
That's what it says. Some doubted. And it says next, it says, And Jesus, he came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, whatever he says next, the answer has to be yes and amen. Because all authority on earth and in heaven has been given to him. He says this, he says, you know this, you've heard this, but I want this to hit you in a deep way this morning. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now, who is he talking to? Us. Me. And you. Being called to disciple-making as a follower of Christ is not a level of Christianity that you make it to one day. Like the moment Jesus saves you, you are called to be a disciple-maker. He says, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What do you... Jesus, what do you want us to do with them? Well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. In other words, Jesus says, I want you to teach them the things that I've taught you. All the things that I told you about, all the things that I taught you, I want you to teach those things to them. I want you to walk with them in those places. And I know you're not going to get it right. I know you're not always going to be perfect at it. And I know that you're going to make mistakes. But just be honest about those places. If you mess up, just be honest about it. He says, I want you to teach them to obey the things and to observe all that I've commanded you. And he says this, he says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We'll talk about that in just a moment. We have to understand that making disciples is your purpose. As a follower of Christ, Making disciples is your purpose. Maybe you've thought that your purpose is to be a great dad, and I hope that you will be a great dad, or maybe a great mom, and I hope that you will be a great mom, or that a teacher, or whatever it is that your career is. Or whatever, that's, listen, those things are callings. Those are not purposes. Your purpose is to be a disciple maker. Wherever you are, wherever he sends you, wherever he places you. And listen, and, and so what are, the, what are the implications of that then? If Jesus has, has sent us, if God has come to rescue us, to send us, then, then what are the, the implications of that? How does that alter our lives? How does that inform and, and, and shape the way that we live our lives? Well, I think there are a couple of things. And... I have a friend who says, I heard him say this the other day, and I thought it was brilliant the way that he said it, and so I'm just going to rip it off from him. But um, what, what I'm about to say to you, for some of you in the room, is going to be, it's going to be one of two things. It's either going to be water or it's going to be fire. And so here's what I mean by that. For some of you, it's going to fire you up, like in a good way, like in a great way. Like you're going to hear these things, you're going to hear the, the implications of that, that by being sent, this is the way. Jesus informs us and tells us that we should live our lives. Like, you're going to hear these things. It's going to fire you up. You're going to be excited and glad to be a part of a church that wants you to live that way, that, in, that, that desires for you to live your life out that way. And if you're new here this morning and hear these things, like some of these things are going to fire you up and be like, yes and amen, this is the kind of church we're looking for. Like, we want to live our lives this way, or we want to learn how to live our lives this way. It's some, for some of you, it's going to be fire for you. For others of you, it's going to be water for you. It's going to put you out. You're going to go, I don't, I don't, no, I'm, I, I like kind of where I'm at now. I like my comfort, I like my convenience. I don't need anybody telling me how I should live my life. So I'm out. No, thank you. So it's either going to be water or fire for you. That was amazing. <laughs> it's either going to be water or fire for you. So which one's it going to be? Which one's it going to be? Number one, implication number one, your life. If Jesus has sent us, if we have been sent by Jesus, your life has a greater purpose than what you may be living for. Did you know that? Your life has a greater purpose than what you may be living for. 
as Christians, some of us, again, like, like we are called to a greater purpose because we have a brief time on this earth. The scriptures tell us that life is a vapor, and Jesus calls us to use it for a grand and glorious purpose. And so like John, like John has written down in his gospel, we get to carry the message that came to us, that saved us. Don't ever forget this. Hear me, church. If you are a follower of Christ, if you're a Christian, do not ever forget the fact that you were not born a Christian. You did not come out of your mother's womb a follower of Jesus. You were far from God at one point, and he saved you and rescued you. And there are other people that are far from God in this room and outside these doors and in your neighborhood and your workplace in your schools and where your kids do dance and where they play soccer and where they play baseball and everywhere else. But we get to carry that message to them to those who have not heard the message so that they too can believe and receive grace. And so again, I go back to the question that I asked you before. What are you living for? What is your purpose? You've been given a greater purpose than what you may be living for. Your purpose, again, is, is not just to make it through life and hopefully live a long and prosperous life, although I hope that is true for all of us in the room. I don't know how much time I have. I don't know how much time you have, but we're called to make use of the time for a greater purpose. Secondly, another implication is, is that if we are sent, then we are called to impact culture, not exit the culture. We are called to impact the culture, not exit the cult culture. I think one of the most damaging things that we do and that we can do as followers of Christ is that we can lock ourselves into some kind of Christian subculture bubble and say, I'm a Christian, I'm over here, I live this way, the rest of y'all are going to hell. Like, that's not the gospel. That is not what Jesus intends for us. That is not what the, the scriptures even describe to us. Should we be set apart? Absolutely. It's like, hey, okay, well, what about that whole thing, be in the world, not of the world, that whole thing? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's look at it really quickly. John 17, verse 14. This is what Jesus says. Jesus, this is his prayer. We call this the, the high priestly prayer. God is, Jesus is praying to God, and this is what he says. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. He's talking about his disciples. He says, I, listen, he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Jesus is saying, I'm not asking you for, for you to, to take them out of the world and, and create this, you know, commune of, of Christians and subculture where like the world and, and culture is not able to get in. What I'm saying is I'm asking that, that they are in the world, but that the world does not corrupt them and make them evil. Why? This is why. This is what he says next. He says, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Jesus says, I want you to mold them and shape them into your image. Put them on the process of becoming holy. That's what sanctify means. Your word is truth. Listen, listen. This is what Jesus says. This is his prayer for you and for me. He says, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. <laughs> Jesus says, I, we're, send, we're not taking you out of the world. We're actually sending you into the world. One of my favorite passages in the Old Testament is jo uh, Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah, the, the prophet Jeremiah, it's, it's, uh, there's uh, chapter 29. It says, letter to the exiles. That's sort of the, the heading around Jeremiah 29. And the context of that is, is that God has sent, hear me, God has sent the people of Israel, his people, the Jewish people, he has sent them into exile with the Babylonians, the pagan Babylonians, sent them into exile. But what God tells them to do while they are in exile is not to remove themselves from the culture, but to actually engage the culture. It's verse 4, 
uh, 29, he says this to him. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to build houses. I want you to plant gardens. I want you to take wives and have children. And I want you, this is what he says, he says, I want you to seek the welfare of the city. He says, I want you to seek the peace of the city. What is God telling the people? While they're in exile in Babylon, in Babylon, he says, I want you to become a part of the culture and I want you to impact the culture. That's what I want you to do. That's what you, we are called to impact the culture, not exit the culture. Because we have been sent into the culture. And so we need to change the not of the world, in the world phrase. We need to change it not of the world, but sent into the world. That's what it needs to say. So we are called to impact culture, not exit the culture. The next implication is this, is, and I think this is the biggest one, and we'll, we'll wrap up here in just a moment. But if we have been sent by Jesus, you are a missionary. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are a follower of Christ, you are a Christian, look at me, you are, and I are a missionary. And I'm not a missionary because I have the title of pastor. I'm a missionary because Jesus has saved me. And if he has saved you, then you are a missionary too. There is no such thing as Sunday-only Christianity. Like, there is no such thing. Like, it is the biggest oxymoron I've ever heard in my entire life to go, you know what, on Sunday, I do the church thing, I do the Jesus thing on Sunday, but Friday and Saturday, those are my days. Like, I do what I want, you know, on Friday and Saturday and however I want and, you know, whatever. And maybe on Wednesdays, too, because that karaoke is really lit. And so I, I go and do that, and, you know, I just kind of do me. And so, but on Sunday, like, I don't do that stuff on Sunday because Sunday's God's day. That's lame. And it is not, listen, listen, hear me when I say this, because I mean this out of a place of love. If that's the way that you want to live, there may be a chance that Jesus hasn't saved you in the first place. But he wants to. You are a missionary seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. <laughs> I had to think about that for a minute. The other day I told my wife, I said something like, yeah, 355 days a year. And she was like, well, what about the other 10 days? I was like, what? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Bachelor degree, master's degree. So we are, we, are, we are missionaries. Paul, listen, this is what Paul said. The Apostle Paul, he, he, he said this. He said, he said whatever, whatever you do, whatever you do, whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever, whatever you do, wherever you go, whatever you do, you do it for the glory of God because you are sent by Jesus. You are a missionary. I am a missionary. And so that means that wherever we go, whatever we do, that means in our home. Like, do you know this, that your home, the place where you live, is a mission outpost? And I don't mean just like inside your home, but yes and amen, absolutely like your family. Like, we are called to be missionaries to our family inside of our home but where your home is like the physical location of your home i believe that god has you there on purpose with a purpose like you didn't end up in your neighborhood by accident do you know that like you may hate your neighborhood but god's like well you know what the people of israel didn't like babylon either but guess what they got there so suck it up buttercup <laughs> like on purpose, with a purpose. God didn't say that in the Bible. I just said that. So just paraphrasing there. But your home, like your neighborhood, where you live. In fact, the book of Acts reminds us, Paul says that, that the boundaries to which that God has placed us in, we are there on purpose. 
And so how you live there matters because your home, your neighborhood is a mission outpost. It's really funny, like we just moved to this neighborhood about seven, eight months ago. And there's only like eight houses in our neighborhood and it's this little cul-de-sac and and I love it. One of the reasons why we chose to to move into this neighborhood was that specific reason right there was because we used to live in a place where there weren't a whole lot of people around us, a whole lot of neighbors. And um, but now we live where, you know, we can all walk out into our front area and we see each other and wave at each other and some of y'all like hate that you like you want like 5,000 acres and you want to be absolutely you want to cross a river to get to your house and that's okay like not me I like being around people and so um but that's you that's that's cool but we live in this neighborhood and um like we've got this great backyard we got a fish in the backyard we've got a deck back there and it's a great place to cook and hang out but I honestly like I don't like hanging out back there very much and and the reason why is because like I want to talk to my neighbors and I, and I want to get to know them. And I want to be able to hopefully at some point maybe even share the gospel with them. And, and maybe that time will come, but I, I want to be a light to them in our neighborhood because this is what, like, God, I believe that God has us there for that reason and purpose. Just like he has you in your neighborhood for that reason and purpose. Like, we're, listen, we are too good at coming home, opening the garage door, pulling in shutting the garage door, and then spending all of our time out in the backyard where none of our neighbors can ever see us. Like, we're really good at that. Like, I'm weird. I like to hang out in the driveway sometimes, just like going to the mailbox 12 times, just so I can hopefully see one of my neighbors. Like, God, that guy checks his mail a lot. He must be some kind of drug dealer or something. I don't, I don't know. Because like, I, I want to talk to my neighbors. Because I believe that God has me there on a pur- for, pur- for a purpose. And I believe that God has you in your neighborhood for a purpose, too, because your home is a mission outpost. But not just your home. Like, oh, okay, well, actually, let me back up. One of the things I want to say about this, this is really important. We, you know, we've talked about Dollar Club. And I told you last week that, that for Dollar Club this month, we're actually doing something a little different. And here's what we're doing with Dollar Club this month. We're giving Dollar Club to you. We're giving Dollar Club to you. And here's, here's what I want you to do with it. I want you to take Dollar Club this month, and I want you to throw a party in your neighborhood. I want you to throw a barbecue, put some hot dogs on the grill, bring the grill out to the front instead of around back, open the garage door, maybe go get a bounce house, get one of those little pools if you don't have a pool, whatever. Like, what, like go and get your neighbors and say, hey, come over, I'm, we're having a barbecue, come over to our house. I want you to be the missionary in your neighborhood. Or maybe you live like in a place where you don't have any neighbors. Maybe you need to do it in your workplace. Maybe you need to do it in your school. But here's, here's what we're going to do. If you will do something like that, and you'll throw a block party or a little barbecue or gather some of your neighbors together, people that you don't know, whatever that looks like, we'll pay for it. You just bring us the receipt. We'll pay for it. We're giving Dollar Club to you. Because we want you to be the missionaries in your home. We want you to be the missionaries in your neighborhood and in your workplace and where you go to school. Or maybe, maybe you need to do it where you play. Maybe your kid goes to dance. Or maybe you have kids on the soccer team or softball team or baseball team or basketball team or, or whatever. And, and maybe you need to get some of those people together. But Jesus has sent you be the missionary to those people, to share the gospel with them and to them. Because you're not just on mission on Sunday, you're on mission every day of the week. Charles Spurgeon, he said this, he said, you are either a missionary or an imposter. There is no in-between. Last but not least, number three, We are rescued by God. We are sent by Jesus, and we cannot do it on our own. We cannot do it on our own. That's why Jesus gives the Holy Spirit. In fact, he says this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, but you, this is right before he ascends into heaven, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. In other words, you will be the ones who tell. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
So the work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus gives is that he makes us able to do what we are simply not able to do on our own because he is power. And so you hear these things, you think, man, I would really love to be, but like I'm super introverted. Like I don't like talking to people. I don't like being around people. And like, but you know what? I know that you don't, and I get that. Or, or there's, you've got a hang up or this, like there's something that stands in the way of you doing these things and engaging in these things. But here's what I know to be true, is that this is why Jesus said when he said, I want you to go and make disciples. This is why he said, and I will be with you always. Because he knows that you and I, on our own, under our own power, are not able to do it. But through him and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are more than capable. We are more than able. Think about this. There is no greater purpose than to be on mission for Jesus, to help people follow Jesus. And to think that he has placed this group of people, all of you and you and you and us and those of you watching online and everybody over at City Lights Church in Clinton that are with us, like everybody, he has placed this group of people together to be like-minded believers to come together and to serve him. And we are uniquely commissioned to take this message that John wrote down for us to the world for the same purpose that John wrote it down in the first place, so that they and that you might believe. And our unique commission is to help people follow Jesus to become fully engaged disciples of Jesus. And so John Piper, he's a pastor and writer, theologian, John Piper wrote this once. He said, our great purpose, our great purpose is to be in the peace of God by the power of God to do the will of God for the glory of God and the good of others. And the good of others. And you get to be a part of that. And I get to be a part of that. But we get to be a part of it together. And so don't miss out on the great honor that God has given you as his ambassador. We have been saved into the greatest institution that the world has ever seen so that we can proclaim the greatest message that the world has ever heard. It's what we get to do. So that they might believe, so that you might believe. And so as we wrap our time up here together this morning as we sing a song together we have as we do each week here at Ridge we have communion available the body of Christ the bread the, the blood of Christ the, the the juice available here and also in the very back corner back there but before you come and take communion this morning before we come and partake in the sacrifice of Christ that makes all of this possible that sends us into this great purpose and mission for our lives I want to ask you to think one more time what are you living for what are you living for what do you want to live for and whatever stands in the way of you living for the glory of God and his mission that you lay it at his feet and then come to the table will you pray with me Father, we are thankful and grateful for, God, your call on our lives. God, I pray for those of us in the room this morning, those who may be watching online, whenever they get to watch, God, God, I pray that, that as they consider this question that you have posed to us, what are we living for? God, that you draw from our hearts, God, anything that stands in the way of your mission and purpose for our lives. God, if it is sinful, God, that we repent. God, if it is a, a good thing that we've made a God thing, God, that you help us reorder our lives and our hearts, God, in a way that puts you first above all things. And God, for those of us who know that without a doubt that we are called into this mission, God, would you give us the courage God, would you give us the bravery and the faith 
to boldly step into these places, to be the missionary that you have called us to be because you have sent us as you have been sent. It's in your name we pray. Hey, we invite you to, to take the next step that God is leading you to, whatever that may be. And, and maybe it's to engage in, in using Dollar Club to engage your neighborhood or workplace or, or where your kids play or where you play or whatever that looks like. And, and whatever that next step is, we want to help you take that next step. But you need to let us know 
what that next st step is. And so take your Connect card and, and put there in the comments section, it's like, hey, here's, here's what I think my next step may be. Or maybe you don't know what your next step is and you just want somebody to help you figure that out. And, and that's, that's what we do. We are here to help you and I help each other to follow Jesus, to become fully engaged disciples of Christ. And so however we can do that, we want to help you do that, but let us know. So either use the Connect card in your seat, drop it off at the table on the way out, called Ridge Central there, stop by there, or use the online connect card, ridgechurch.info. Uh, if you're online watching, you can use that there or uh, in here too. But if you are new here today, we invite you to be on this mission with us. And so we're so glad that you are here. Stop by Ridge Central and say hi to somebody. Can't wait to see you back next week. Love you. We'll see you then. Nobody, nobody, nobody sees you. Nobody, nobody will believe you. Every day you try to pick up all the pieces All the memories that somehow never leave you Nobody, nobody, nobody sees you Nobody, nobody will believe you God only knows what you've been